Good morning and welcome to the Saturday morning lecture at the LA Chess Club. Uh, I am going to be doing a couple of games out of this book that I've already touted. Uh, the 1,000 best short games of chess ever. Um, all of these games include great tactics, great position, and some, I guess, what we'd call bolt from the blue move that came out of nowhere that changes the entire complexion after what I consider to be probably very decent opening moves. We're going to start with a game from Texas, 1938. We have Pulios versus Mr. Underwood. Pulios is white, starts d4, great opening move for the grandmasters and the masters who like to start very slowly and have a slow, steady buildup. Not a lot of fireworks with the d4 opening as opposed to e4, which creates all kind of tactics almost immediately. So Mr. Underwood said, whoops, switch that that was a little wrong there d4 d5 <clears throat> so we have a classical opening d4 d5 okay no hypermodern of knight f6 and c4 everybody know what the name of this opening is queen's, queen's gambit did i just hear you say that e4 creates a lot of tactics yes and yes very No, no, they're incorrect. It's D4. A passive slow game is D4. E4 is the tactical game. Fireworks, Fireworks almost okay. immediately. <coughs> yes. And we'll see, okay? All right, so black has a number of choices. Black can take the pawn that's offered, but it's really not a good idea because white will immediately put a second pawn in the center and control two of the four center squares with the pawns crisscrossing and controlling the other two. So it's really not a really good idea. And besides, if black does take this pawn for, quote, free, uh, there's no way that black can hold on to this pawn for very long. He's going to have to know when to give it back. And there are variations where you can take the pawn if you know when to give this pawn back. If you try to hold on to this extra pawn later in the game, you're not going to make it, and it's, your whole position is going to collapse on the queen side. So Mr. Underwood said, okay, you take and I'll just take back, so there's no problem here. And it looks sort of like a French against e4. The problem is, and actually it's very nice because you can see the dark squared bishop's going to come out. He has a check right away. The problem with this e6 move is that this light squared bishop for a very long time is going to be blocked on this diagonal. And black's problem is to somehow get this bishop into the game early on. So most of the time, somewhere down the line, black's going to play b6 and bring the bishop out here and fianchetto it along the b7 diagonal all the way down here. Okay? So now white has a whole bunch of choices. He can take, but why solve black's problem of allowing the bishop to be developed by just trading pawns and getting rid of this block, blocker on the light diagonal? So it's not in white's best interest to take this pawn and just trade. So developing a piece, very nice, and getting ready to push e4 now, because if the pawn takes, the knight will just take, and you're going to have a piece in the center. Black has no pieces developed, and white's going to be way ahead in development. So black being, looks like Mr. Underwood was a master, develops a piece, king side, knight f6. This bishop's going to probably come out and create what against the king with this knight? A pin, okay? Out of the eight major tactics, and according to Mick, 15 minor ones in chess, pins are the major tactic that you are going to use more often than any other. More than a knight fork checking and then taking the rook. Knight forks are one of the major tactics, okay? But pins are the ones you're going to use most often. And when you study master and grandmaster games, you're going to see them create pins more than any other tactic. I think probably because it's the easiest one to start off with in the opening sequences of the game. And any time during the game, if you can hold on to your bishops and create another pin and build up on it, you will see that it creates enormous pressure. All right, so we have knight f6 for black. And immediately, white creates what on the black queen? A pin, OK? So black doesn't want a pin. Now, you, of course, you could just move the queen away off the pin. 
but then of course the bishop would take, the pawn would have to take, and there's no protection left when the king castles along the g-file. This pawn would be sitting over here and the king would be sort of like open season on him on the g-file. So it's not a really good idea. So exactly. Bishop to e7, very nice. Yes? Is there a variation in this where black can go for a Nimzo Indian instead of defending the knight there, or is it already too late if he doesn't do it right away? Well, he could do it. I mean, he could create his own pin. He doesn't have to take away the pin. He could create his own pin here. The problem is with the Nimzo, this knight, after this bishop takes, and usually the queen comes to c2 and takes back, the knight swoops into e5 and attacks either the pawn or the queen sitting here at c3. You're not going to be able to do that now because the pin has been created. So black opted to take away the pin that white created rather than create his own pin. Petrosian had a rule, and Petrosian was world champion around 1960, 61, 62. The Petrosian rule says, when there are two attacks going on simultaneously, you are creating an attack on your opponent, your opponent is creating an attack on you. And here, your black's opponent is creating the pin. You could create your own pin. But Petrosian's rule was, take care of your opponent's attack first, and then go with your attack. I think it makes sense because, in a way, you're sort of getting a free move. Okay, if there were two simultaneous attacks and you took care of the, his attack on you, your attack is still going on on him, and now he has to take a move to deal with your attack. And it's sort of like you get a free move because he can't do what he wants to do, he must deal with your attack. So here, Black decided to stop the pin rather than create his own pin. Because now he might have a free move. He might be able to do something. You know, now he can move the queen up. He can get off this. So there's all kinds of options when you stop your opponent's attack first. Okay. White e pushes e3, obviously, to allow this light squared bishop to come out. So now if black takes the pawn, white will just take back with the bishop. And he will clear out one of the pieces getting ready to do what, guys? Yes, castle. Now, black has already done that, so black takes advantage of the fact that he's cleared out his two minor pieces on the king's side, and he now castles. And as I've said before in the lectures, a castled king, according to computer analysis, is four moves safer than an uncastled king in the center. That doesn't mean that it's impossible to checkmate this king. It just means it will take white an extra four moves to checkmate him, as opposed to black checkmating this king because he's still in the center. That's why castling is so important. It sort of gives you an extra four moves of freedom. You can create a whole lot of different scenarios with those extra four moves. White, on the other hand, with an uncastled king in the center, is going to probably have to start fighting off attacks coming down on his king because he's still in the center. So if I were white, I'd try to get these two pieces out immediately and castle. And sure enough, after Black Castles, White heard me, and he decided to play Knight F3. Okay, and he's cleared out one of the two minor pieces, getting ready to castle. And so let's take a, a quick evaluation. Remember, chess is a game of balances. You always have a plus and a minus for every move in chess, and you have to equate whether the plus outweighs the minus every single move. Chess is not an easy game. It's easy to learn. You can learn the moves in 10 minutes. You can learn the understanding and dynamic of the game in 10 minutes. But it will take you the rest of your life to learn the subtleties, the nuances, and all of the possibilities. And you'll still never quite understand all of it. So <clears throat> right now, white is trying to catch, uh, get back those four moves of safety that black's got on his king. OK. And sure enough, pawn to b6. And what did I say before? Because this pawn is blocking the light squared bishop along this diagonal, black has decided he will develop his piece. And for the rest of the game, these light squares will be under control of this bishop at b7, which is very nice. And we call this a fianchetto. Okay.
White says, it's time for me to castle and get my king safe. You've done it. Everybody's doing exactly what they should do in the first eight to 10 moves of chess. Develop your minor pieces and castle with an eye of controlling the center because the fight for chess really is these four center squares all the way through the game, all the way through to the last stages of end game when maybe the pawns are over on the wings and the center is not that important. You really have to block those pawns from marching down. But for 95% of the game, the control of the four center squares is paramount and is super important. Sure enough, after white develops here, black develops his bishop on this nice long diagonal. Now black is thinking, I'll take this pawn. And I don't mind you taking back because this opens up this huge diagonal for my bishop. And when you castle your king over here, I'll be eyeing that g2 pawn from way over there. Like I said before, bishops are like long-range artillery. They work best from a long way away because they control so many squares. Where knights are in your face pieces because they can only hop two or three squares. Yeah, Rita. What if black did that? D take C. First, before. No, after. Now that he's got the bishop. Right. Well, now let's see what white does. If you're white, what's your move after he plays B? What do you think white should do? Yes. Go ahead. C5. C5 would be interesting and block off the bishop here. I think opening here and then taking here. But why did he develop these two pieces so quickly? Yes. Yes, I think I, if I'm white, I think my move right now is to castle and get my king safe. I've got to get those four moves of safety back. Let's see if that's true. Nope, he doesn't. Yes. If white castles, it gives black time to get his knight to g4. And if he takes that pawn, d takes c, he's got a fried liver. Uh, oh, oh over here. No, no, no. not here because he doesn't have Sorry, the, it's yeah. this bishop that would be here for fried liver. All right, if I think you're right. I, 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 if I'm white, I would castle. But white didn't do that. White decided to take the pawn. And I think that, I'm not sure, but I think, I don't know if that's a mistake or not. I don't know why, well, you see, he's opening the center before he's castled and got his king safe. And black says, okay, I'll take back. But you see what white did was is, since the bishop moved from this diagonal because the pawn was blocking it, white did a little maneuver where <laughs> the bishop's over here, but now it's blocked by its own pawn. So in a, in a way, he sort of outsmarted black and he says, I'm not going to let you do that along this diagonal. I'm going to block it with your own pawn. And so he did that. Okay. That's very interesting. So now maybe Black's going to have to take an extra move and move back to get back because this is now like blocked, totally blocked. Yeah. Couldn't Black have taken with his knight? Yes, he could have taken with the knight, and the knight takes, and the queen takes, I think. But then I think pawn takes, and I think there's a tempo. I think there's a tempo oh, here. Well, if the queen comes up here, I don't know, I'm sure maybe the knight here, because it's protected by the bishop, and then you're look, eyeing c7. There's all kinds of, I mean, how many moves into the future can you see? When you do a move, what's the consequences of that one move? I'm going to do this now. Yeah, he has to do this. Oh, and then I'll do that. Then he's going to have to do that. And then I will do this. And he'll. How many moves into the future can you structurally see it in your mind's eye like you're watching a replay? How far into the future can your brain take you to the consequences of that first move? If you can see seven or eight moves into the future, for both white and black, which would be like 14 ply, which is really a lot, then you're playing around expert level. Masters can routinely see eight to 10. Grandmasters, if they have to, can push it to 15. They can actually see 15 moves into the future. They all have incredible photographic memories, and they are just that you're just born with that. And it, but they still have to be trained at chess. The rest of us mere mortals that don't have photographic memories, we have to learn principles of chess, and then we can stay within our own level. That's why they have eight levels of chess: grandmasters, masters, experts. A players, B players, C players, all the way down to J players, brand new players or J players, and the U.S. Chess Federation will give you 100 points for joining and say, learn some chess, but here's 100 points for joining us. Grandmasters now are at 2,500 points and above. How do you get your points? 
you play people that have already established along the hierarchy where they are, and your win-loss ratio determines what your point total is. Okay, there's a formula that they work out. In this kind of an opening, uh, if he wanted to get have his uh, Fianchetto bishop active, why did he take with the pawn? Instead the of the knight, yeah, because yeah, I don't yeah, think he yeah. wanted to lose this bishop. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> because I think this bishop would take here. The queen then is forced to take here. And then when the knight takes back, I guess the bishop would take. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff where the I think black center collapses, okay, because of this. So it's standard in this kind of an opening to take with the pawn. Well, the general rule in chess, and remember for every general rule, you're going to break it. I mean, for every rule you follow, you're going to break it. And the key to master play and expert play and A player is to know when you're allowed to break those principles. And of course, you can't break them until you followed them. You can't start off the game breaking them. Okay? The first eight to ten moves, you have to follow them. Then you can break them. All right? The thing is, is that you have to know when to break them. And if you can really master that timing when it's the correct moment, to break a principle, then you're going to be elevated in your play and your understanding of the game. But how do you get there? You study the games that have gone on before like this. You study tactics. You study puzzles. Okay, You study theory. And then you get experience by playing against other players. It's not an easy game. Like I've said before, there are other games. Chess is not for everybody. There's tiddlywinks, shoots and ladders. Candyland. I love Candyland because of the purple squares. I think it's great. I just love the colors of the purple squares. Okay, chess is not for everybody. Okay, and you find out if it is. Okay. All right. So I think that uh, White has schnookered Black, and he has uh, blocked off that beautiful diagonal from that bishop, which is really too bad. Okay. And now it's White's turn again after pawn takes pawn. Bishop takes knight. Normally, it is not a good idea to trade your bishop for their knight because bishops do go up to four points in endgame. They start off the game at the beginning and the opening sequences roughly equal to knights, three, three points apiece, maybe 3.2 for the bishop. But as the game goes on, bishops go up to four points. Knights stay at three. So it's a good idea, if you can, to try to hold on to your bishops as long as possible because when you get to endgame, two bishops are worth eight points two knights are still only worth six. Okay, And there are many, many games where their grandmasters have played two knights against the two bishops, and the two bishops win four out of five times, even though you'd think, oh, well, it's got to be a draw. No. The bishops will win four out of five times. They're just that much stronger. And that's because generally in the end game, it's pretty open. Yes, well, because at the end game, the pieces have been traded off, pawns have been traded off, and like, like if the bishop were here, in one move, the bishop can go all the way across the board. If the knight starts off here, is one, two, three, four moves to cross across the board. So you're losing time. You know, it's just the nature of the game. Yeah. At this point, would white be strategizing moving the queen behind the bishop and going... And creating a battery and maybe attempting an h7 check? Yeah, I, I sort of like that. Although... The king would just move over, you would win a pawn, but I'm not sure that would be great. I would prefer putting the bishop here, putting the queen in front, and threatening checkmate. <laughs> I would rather... Pre but then black can just... Right, push G6. exactly. Just push g6, or even push h7 if the bishop's in front, and you just save the pawn. White has that knight on f3. To jump in, okay? Uh, yes, the knight can jump in. If he can get there. Well... White started off by taking the, the knight, so to prevent any kind of problems with the knight jumping over here, because he hadn't castled yet, and I don't think he wanted that. So sure enough, black has to take back. So that was an exchange, and now white makes a strategic decision. He says, I've done a great job of blocking the star piece of black. And this is black's star piece because it was going to control this incredible light diagonal after white castle. But I tricked him into blocking his own bishop. So I'm going to take advantage of that time now, and I'm going to launch an attack on his king before I even get safe with my king. I think I can do that now 
because I don't have to worry about any attacks on my king in the center. I'm okay for at least three or four moves. Three or four moves in chess is a very long time. H4. And what this move is telling black is, I'm probably not going to castle. I'm probably going to stay in the center with my king. And I'm going to use these pawns as battering rams to come and crack open your fortress. I'm going to march this pawn down. I'm going to push this one too. And now the bishop would love to take the pawn. The problem is that it's protected once and protected twice. And it's only being attacked twice, so that wouldn't work out. So this is an announcement to black. Get ready. This is where the attack is going to come. I've already got the bishop lined up against your king. I could always sacrifice the bishop and say check and open up the h file, which would allow my rook to come down if I can get rid of this pawn. So I think that's what his plan is. He's going to push, 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 try to get rid of this pawn and have the rook and the bishop line up on h7. Well, the minute he gets to h5, black can no longer push to h6. No, but he can push h6 and stop the pawn. Yeah, but then he can get the queen in front of the bishop. Right, then he could possibly get the queen up here and come down because then the queen lined up here. Yeah, he's starting an attack. I would say it's four or five moves away. But black has to be able to see and recognize the danger that's coming in the next four or five moves and see if he can stop it, okay? So, and, and here's what the book says right after that move. A danger signal which many players ignore. Few consider that it may involve a strong threat, choosing generally to regard it as a stab at nothing. You can't do that in chess. You really have to tr try to analyze what is the possibility of this pawn keeping push or maybe this pawn being pushed and then there's two pawns coming and cracking open this cubby hole you really 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 have to take it strongly okay so black said i don't think it's anything uh you can attack over here i'm going to try to crack open the center because your king is still stuck here in the center if i can take here you take back i'll bring the rook over i'll start a check you know and that and so i'm going to and the general rule in chess is when somebody attacks you on the wing, you counterattack in the center. But you have to have an eye on what's going on over here. You can't just totally ignore it. So sure enough, aha. And now, here we go. Tactics arise, folks. Here we go. Check. And the bishop sacrificed to get the king lured out from behind his fortress. Sure enough, king takes bishop and says, thank you for four points, you only got one. And now the check with the knight. If the bishop takes the knight and stops the check, the pawn will take back and you will have a check on this king. The king, if it goes back here, the queen will go here and there will be no stopping checkmate here or here. If the king comes out here, then your king is really exposed to a whole bunch of stuff. And so we're going to see what happens with this check. And sure enough, the king just says, I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to move away. Queen up to d3, check. So now you have a real problem for that king. See, if you go here, I think the queen goes here for checkmate. See, because the queen can go behind the king protected by the knight. If the king went here, this would be checkmate with the queen. Right? So, he knew that was dead. He can't come out here because he's still in check, so this is his only move. Wow. So, pawn check, and what you're doing is, if you go back here again, still checkmate with the queen, you can't go back here because you'd be in check. You can't take this pawn because of the rook. You can't take the knight because of this pawn. So your only move is to take the pawn. And the king is on a march. And another check. Well, the knight is protecting this pawn, so you can't take it with the king. You can't take this one. If you go back here, you get checkmated here with the queen. So I think his only move is here, right? 
G3. Yep. No, rook up check. Protected by the knight. So let's see. You can't go anywhere backwards because everything is protected. So you can't go here, and you can't go here, so I guess this is your only move. And now, checkmate. You are in serious trouble when your king is your most advanced piece from your army. <laughs> when your king is leading the troops instead of the troops protecting the king, you are in very serious trouble. and. The key was, of course, the bishop's sacrifice, but you had to be able to see the sequence all the way from the time that the bishop took the pawn and said, check, that was on the 11th move. This was six moves later on the 17th. Self ply. Who was the guy who played white? Uh, white was played by Mr. Pulios, and Mr. Underwood was black. A phenomenal little game. And everything seemed to be okay. Everybody was developing normally. Black had castled, you know. He seemed to be starting his queenside attack. And then a bolt from the blue. You know, bishop to pawn check. And you sacrifice it just out of nowhere. And But you had to be able to see that something was going on. And the reason you could take advantage of it was is because the bishop couldn't take this knight because of this. That was a very clever little game. Really clever. But I really liked the fact that white blocked this bishop. I thought that was a real clever maneuver. And it sort of gave white an extra couple of moves to play around with. And okay. And the other thing about this game is both sides, and white in particular, didn't fully develop all their pieces. And well, no. No. Uh, white developed every piece but his light squared rook. Black developed, of course, these three pieces never moved. So you have seven pieces that you start off the game with, right? So if black is only playing with four, but white was playing with six, white could afford to even sacrifice two and he'd still be even four and four on the board. Here he only sacrificed one. So he was still playing five to four. That's the beauty of getting your pieces out as fast as you can. You're allowed to sacrifice and create the scenarios necessary to do this. If you leave your pieces back on the back rank and push pawns, see all these pawn moves here? These pieces could have been out instead of those pawn pushes. He made a conscious decision not to develop those pieces, but push the pawns first. You need to understand the power of developing quickly, even if it means losing a pawn or two. And Morphy is the first one that came up with that 150 years ago. He said, even if I have to lose two pawns, it's better to get five pieces out against two or three and lose two pawns, because those five pieces can create these kinds of scenarios. What could, Black, what could Black have done to stop that? Because that seems like a pretty standard opening. I, mean, I think maybe G6 and just stop that bishop sack immediately. G6 would have done it. G6 would not have allowed him to take H7. And that it might have allowed, it's a whole different ball game. But that's chess. You know, each time, like I said, there's a plus and a minus. And if you don't see the minus when you make your move, two or three moves later, it's all going to tilt. You know, I said this before, you don't want to play Titanic chess. Once you hit the iceberg, you can run around like they did for two hours, but you're going to sink. Okay, so don't hit the iceberg. Okay. All right, guys, let's do another one. That one was a fun one, because when you go on king marches like that, okay, it lets you know something went terribly wrong.